Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Funerals have been held in Gaza for some of the more than 50 people killed when Israeli troops fired on Palestinian protesters yesterday. In the fiercest clashes since 2014, officials say more than 2,000 people were injured. There have been further smaller protests today as Palestinians commemorate the anniversary of what they call the Nakba, or catastrophe, the mass displacement of Palestinians in violence following the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Our Middle East editor Jeremy Bowen reports now from Gaza. On the border, the soundtrack was anti-Israeli songs, not gunfire. 24 hours after the killing, the big protests have stopped. But tires were burning and Palestinians looked warily towards the Israeli positions. Enterprising traders brought refreshments. So what's next? The Israelis deal with the international political fallout, the Palestinians have 60 dead. Politicians and diplomats abroad call for peace, but real peace talks ended, failed, a long time ago. And with the current generation of Palestinian and Israeli leaders, there is no chance of them being revived. The Israelis started firing tear gas. The crowd, by then, including many families, was getting too big and the young men were getting too close to the border wire. Much of the rage in the protests is brewed in places like Beach Camp, a tented refugee camp in 1948 now much more permanent. It was created as 750,000 Palestinians fled or were forced from their homes in Israel's independence war. Now 70% of Palestinians in Gaza are refugees, stuck fast in history. At the Al Farouk Mosque, Yazan Tobasi's funeral was much quieter than his death, shot through the eye during the protests. His body was wrapped in the Hamas flag. He was 23, and his friends were there to bury him. There were tender moments. Israel says it told them to stay away from the border, and Hamas is responsible for what happened. His friend Mohammed al Barawi said Yazan had worked at the hospital without pay because of Gaza's collapsing economy. Poverty and grief breed anger. At Shifa, the main hospital, wounded men were being transferred to Egypt for surgery. Inside, they were still treating casualties from the protest. This boy is 16. All day I've been asking Palestinians if Hamas forced them to risk their lives at the protests. No one said yes. I did it because Jerusalem is Palestinian, said Wadir Aras, unemployed, 24 years old. This is the busiest time at the hospital since the 2014 war. As a human being, I, I speak, it's, 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 it's horrible to think about. If you see to, uh, yesterday the uh, situation, it's, it's horrible. Crying, bloody, pain, painful. What's happening? After the protests, it seems that many people are hoping for some kind of turning point. But the fundamentals of this conflict don't change. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News. Well, the antagonism between Israel and the Palestinians is one of the world's deadliest flashpoints and focused on land and borders following the war that established Israel in 1948. Well, 70 years ago, Gaza was controlled by Egypt and the West Bank by Jordan, and both were home to hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees driven from Israel. But the Israelis captured them both along with East Jerusalem in the Six-Day War of 1967 and never fully gave them back. The Oslo Accords of 1993, a set of agreements that tried to establish a long-term peace process, did give the Palestinians the right to run parts of both areas. And now, nearly two million live in Gaza. But Israel controls its coastline and most of its access points. 
well. Jeremy Bowen joins us now live from Gaza. Jeremy, so uh, no repeat of the terrible scenes we saw yesterday. No, all that has ended, well, subsided. Uh, the thing about the intractability of this conflict is that violence is built into it, and violence will occur again. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month. But it's going to happen. And it keeps on happening because things don't change. And as far as Gaza's concerned, what doesn't change is that two million people are cooped up in here. What, on the other side of the border wire, Israel sees Hamas particularly as a really serious threat. Uh, Israel said that those demonstrators coming towards the wire were potentially breaching Israel's sovereignty, um, putting Israelis in jeopardy, so they had to do what they, what they did, and they're defending all of that. But what is, I think, awful for people here, and it's sad to keep seeing it, is the way that violence reoccurs again and again and again, and in the absence of progress, in the absence of change, that will continue. Jeremy, thank you for that. Jeremy Bowen live there in Gaza. Now, Palestinian authorities reported that two more people died under the fire of the Israeli military on the Gaza border with Israel, bringing the total number of fatalities to 62 since yesterday. Many more remain critically injured in hospital. There is mounting international condemnation of Israel's use of force, with the United Nations calling it an outrageous human rights violation. Yesterday's protests were the bloodiest day for Palestinians since the war with Israel four years ago. In a moment, the Israeli ambassador to the UK, Mark Regev, will be talking to us and we'll be hearing from our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, in Tel Aviv. But first, let's go to our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman, who's in Gaza. Jonathan. Well, two dead, as you say, 15 injured by live gunshot wounds today. Those are the official figures uh, from the Ministry of Health here. The Israeli army is saying that some 4,000, what it calls, rioters were protesting uh, today um, and that live rounds were fired only selectively. But the plan was for these protests to go on for two days and, and they, they have not really um, succeeded as, as well as Hamas might have hoped. It's possible that Hamas has the power to turn these protests off and on. After all, uh, not much happens in the Gaza Strip without Hamas knowing about it. But it's also possible that health officials here feel so overloaded by the number uh, of injured people from yesterday uh, and Palestinians weren't prepared to die or be injured in such large numbers that the protests were much smaller today than they were yesterday. Here's my report on today's events and I must warn you it does contain scenes that some viewers may find distressing. What was supposed to be the biggest day of protests didn't turn out that way. A few demonstrators were dispersed with tear gas, but most preferred to catch their breath and bury their dead. On a day to remember 70 years of collective catastrophe, there were dozens of personal catastrophes too. Like the death of Yassan Tubasi, a 22-year-old shot by Israeli troops. Don't worry, they chanted, we will continue fighting your battle. Okay, this was uh, injured yesterday. In an intensive care unit, we found a 12-year-old boy battling for his life after being shot in the head. He's unarmed, peacefully going to that place, and he was shot. Is he going to survive? Mostly, hopefully yes, but if he's in serious condition, probably he's going to die. Mahmoud Sawalhi finished his school exams last week. And as doctors took a scan of his brain this morning, his family told me yesterday's protest was the first he'd ever attended. His elder brother, Mohammed, was with him when he was shot, driving 500 meters, he said, away from the fence. We were driving a tuk-tuk. We saw a jeep on the Israeli side stop. Four soldiers got out. We kept driving and they fired the first bullets. We were just driving to join the people. Outside the family home, the vehicle which had four children in the back when Israeli bullets hit. And inside, the boy's father, Ashraf, too ill to visit his son because he too was shot. 
I don't regret going, he said. It's our national duty to protest, and I would do it again. In this hospital, there are no more beds to treat the injured, with well over a thousand suffering gunshot wounds across the Gaza Strip. All the operating theatres are working non-stop. An Israeli commander said every round of bullets was approved before it was fired, every target spotted in advance, that 24 of the dead were documented terrorists. This army video showing what are said to be attackers throwing pipe bombs and grenades at soldiers and the fence. But whatever Israel says, unarmed civilians were shot in large numbers yesterday. Palestinians without much to live for, hoping to rattle the bars of what's often described as an open-air jail. In all this, perhaps too depleted to fight another war with Israel, hoping these protests are a new tactic to draw attention to Gaza's plight and still refusing to recognize Israel's right to exist. Earlier, I sat down with Ghazi Hamad, a senior Hamas official, and I put it to him, the White House's claim that the violence yesterday was caused by Hamas. I think this is a false statement because if you go there, you will find 100,000 of people who are affiliated for, for, to the Palestinian, all Palestinian factions, ordinary people, children, women. You will not see any kind of flags there any political symbols, all but, people but went... Were, but were you not using the crowds as cover for violent no, protests? No, I think we don't use them. People, they have their convinced inside their heart. They want to struggle for their freedom and their independence and their dignity. But you don't deny, do you, that the protests were violent? No. People the, tried the to violence, attack the fence. The violence, we are going there without arms, without guns. Everyone watch the Palestinians are moving peaceful everywhere maybe you have strong protest but we don't have arms the uh, people guns. did try by, by, get across by the peaceful fence. means we want to send a message to the world that we should not be imprisoned in this cage forever it's enough for uh, uh, for 12 years of a blockade and embargo and collective sanctions against people here people are fed up it doesn't sound as if you in hamas take the slightest shred of responsibility for these deaths and these shootings and some why, of them why trying there's, to get Why a there's a soldier are obligated to shoot people? Why? The, if there is one who was hurt or injured, no one. And I think you have to ask the Israeli soldier why they are shooting innocent people. Women, children, people that are 15, 14 years old. They don't have guns, they don't show any kind of a threat for them. This question is not directed to the Palestinians. So if there was an independent inquiry under the auspices of the UN, we don't know, would you in Hamas participate? If there is an honest independence inquiry committee, okay, they are welcome to come to Gaza. It's open for them. We, we welcome this many times, but I, I, I believe 100% Israel will, will uh, object this. They will not accept because I think it's not the first crimes of Israel. Israel committed crimes every time in Gaza. Since 1948, we have a big number of massacres. So do you think the violence has made it more likely that the economic blockade on Gaza will be lifted, or has it simply entrenched positions? Look, we tried in different directions, but I think we need someone to support the Palestinians, to give him more support, either from the Arabic neighbors or from the international community. Well, now, while hundreds of Palestinians are mourning their dead, life for most Israelis has largely been unaffected by the Gaza protests. And support for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's hardline stance against unrest in the enclave remains strong. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, has spent the day in the internationally recognised Israeli capital, Tel Aviv, from where she now joins us. Lindsay. John, I'm on a street corner in Tel Aviv. Things are pretty lively here, people in restaurants and so on. Uh, there's just been a small left-wing demonstration which has broken up. But, you know, that's really not affecting the government very much. Turkey has withdrawn its ambassadors to both Washington and to Israel. A couple of European countries, um, Belgium and Ireland, have called in Israeli ambassadors to basically give them a small dressing down. But this is just a slap on the wrist. It really isn't any kind of concerted diplomatic 
attack or even censure against the Israeli government for the violence that has occurred in the Gaza Strip. And really nothing that we're seeing here in Israel or internationally is likely to change Israeli government policy. Left-wing Israelis, an increasingly rare species, protested about the killings in Gaza here in Tel Aviv and in small groups across the country. The single pro-government counter-demonstrator, more representative of the majority view. Some are here because bitter and painful experience has convinced them that Israel is on the wrong track. I lost my 14-year-old daughter in a suicide bombing in Jerusalem. Ronnie lost his two sons, and it must get uh, to an end because the price we are paying for the continuation of the occupation is horrible. They surged across King George Street, 300 people trying to stop the traffic flow. But last night, Tel Aviv saw a far larger gathering, not in protest against the killing of Gazans, nor even in favor of the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem but to welcome home the victorious chicken-dancing Eurovision Song Contest star, Netta Barzilai. <laughs> Euphoria by night, sunshine by day. The beach in Tel Aviv is only an hour's drive along the coast from Gaza, but a world away. Everyone here knows what happened there yesterday. But this is the Israeli way of life, not unlike that of many Europeans. And a majority agree with their government that military measures are needed to protect it. I think it's our legal right to live here. And they can't interrupt us to live here. They, they always send their, um, people to kill us. And what can we do? Benjamin Netanyahu is OK in the few weeks, uh, last few weeks, but all the last years, he doesn't make a, a solution with the Palestinians. But on the other end, the Palestinians also doesn't want, doesn't want a solution. So Israelis shrug when the UK mildly criticizes Israel. The violence that we have seen is destructive of peace efforts. I think it is in everybody's interest to show restraint and ensure that we can see those peace efforts being put into place. And even when the French use stronger language. We are committed to Israel's security. I have said this repeatedly in this chamber. But the security of Israel does not justify this level of violence. I must say it here as well. The Palestinians also have a right to peace and security. The tide is all flowing in Israel's direction at the moment. And with President Trump in the White House, there's no pressure from inside or out that's likely to change that. Lindsay Hilson in Tel Aviv. Well, uh, Israel's ambassador to London, Mark Regev, is here in the studio with me. But first, just let's listen to the UN human rights spokesperson, uh, Rupert Colville, speaking earlier today. A number of the demonstrators did approach the fence through stones and Molotov cocktails at Israeli security forces personnel and flew kites laden with petrol-soaked material. Some tried to damage the fence that separates Gaza from Israel. Others burned tires. Israeli forces responded with tear gas, plastic bullets, and various types of live ammunition, some causing horrific wounds and lifelong disabilities. We stress again, lethal force may only be used as a measure of last, not first, resort and only when there is an immediate threat to life or serious injury. An attempt to approach or crossing or damaging the Green Line fence do not amount to a threat of serious, uh, to life or serious injury and are not sufficient grounds for the use of live ammunition. Well, uh, let's just therefore question that. I mean, he says there were not the grounds to use live rounds at that moment. We use live rounds when it is necessary to protect our people. It's never the first option, but it has to be something in your toolkit if you want to protect your public from terrorists who are trying to storm the border. Having it in your toolkit is quite different from unleashing it uh, on a large crowd of largely unarmed people. I uh, reject the premise of your question. 
no one unleashed. Uh, we were very surgical, as, uh, as careful as one can be in a difficult combat situation. 1,360 wounded people, many of them in hospital, with appalling injuries. So there were over 40,000 people uh, in these riots. We had people charging towards the border with wire cutters, with explosives, with petrol bombs. They were trying to break into Israel and, frankly, to kill our people. Uh, Whose lives were at stake at that very moment? Our people's lives Who, which were Which are people? Israeli citizens. We yeah, have, but where were they? We have civilian... Where were they? I'm answering your question. We have civilian communities immediately adjacent to that border. We have farms, we have townships within half a kilometre, a few hundred metres from that border. It's our obligation to protect our civilians. And let's let the Hamas people speak for themselves. They said, the leader of Hamas said, the goal is to penetrate into Israel. He said to cut out the hearts, to cut out the hearts, to kill the Israeli civilian population. Obviously, we have to protect our people. Yeah, well, that, that's the sort of sloganizing that you are very used to from Hamas. We shouldn't take those threats seriously, John. So perhaps we shouldn't take the UN seriously when they say an attempt to approach a crossing or crossing the fence does not represent a threat to life or serious injury. There are not sufficient grounds for the use of live ammunition. We would say the following. If you are trying to cross into our country, destroy the security fence, and you've declared your goal is to kill Israeli civilians, I think that's a threat that we would be irresponsible not to take seriously. Well, what would you say to the, the family of uh, Mahmoud Sahwali? He's 12, uh, he's in intensive care, he's just finished his first school, his elder brother was with him when he was shot, they were driving 500 metres away from the fence. Is there any excuse for him to be having to have a brain scan now for a bullet that entered his head? It's a tragedy, and I don't know Doesn't exactly what... Doesn't sound very surgical, does it? First of all, we, we have no information whatsoever. If you have as no to information, how, this... how can you be certain? No, you don't have information either, though. How this young man, this teenager, this child, how he was injured. You only have the story that you are told. And I understood the father from the report is obviously an activist supporting the Hamas struggle here. So I think one has to be careful. Well, it's unlikely that anybody living in Gaza is entirely indifferent to the struggle, as you describe it. People of Gaza, as your reporter said in his own report, uh, live under the very hard uh, fist of the Hamas government and nothing really can happen in Gaza without Hamas's approval. I mean, one is tempted to ask, what would an attack that was not measured and was not surgical, what would that look like? We wouldn't want to see that, obviously, but the main thing for us is... No, no, perhaps we... you'd describe it. Describe what, sir? What would a, an attack which was neither measured nor surgical, what would it look well, like? Well, the sort of thing Hamas does, to indiscriminately fire into a crowd, to throw explosives into a crowd, the sort of things Hamas would But like that to... is actually precisely what the Israeli Defence Forces no, did. True, there was no targeting no, sir, that's hit. Not, People not, that's were just even, hit. That's not even close to reality, sir. But you can see it from the very pictures that everybody's transmitted around the world. How is it that a British minister, one of your friends, the large volume of live fire is extremely concerning. We implore Israel to show larger constraints. That's Alistair Burt, the Foreign Office Minister. You never hear a British minister criticising Israel on that level. I think we have to be clear. Israel was facing a direct attack on its border, once again with a self-declared goal of Hamas to come into Israel and kill our people. We had to defend our border. And I'd ask the following question. I think it's a legitimate question. We know what Hamas says about Israelis. We know that Hamas believes that every Israeli civilian is a legitimate target. We know this is a terrorist organization recognized as such internationally that, that has a track record of brutally attacking and killing innocent civilians. Well, as you want to we talk about take, Hamas, are, you prepared, are you prepared to respond to their offer to join in independent investigation into what has happened? How does Hamas do an independent investigation? When no, they're you... prepared to join it. It will be independent. Yes, but it's... It will it... be independently yes, run. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. And, and do you believe them? Are you happy to join it? Tell me, what checks and balances are there in Gaza for there to be any sort of independent investigation? I'll ask you the following question. Can someone stand up and tell a Channel 4 reporter, you know, Hamas are terrible, we want them to leave? You can't have independent demonstrations that in Gaza. That is not the question I asked No, but it is relevant, The question sir. I'm no, asking is, wrong. at what point will you ever talk to Hamas? No, but first of all, I want to finish that point. It, it needs to be said. How does one have an independent investigation in an authoritarian 
theological uh, society where there is no independent you don't civil mean society. That there is any independent entity that could hold an inquiry at which they would listen to you and they would listen to Hamas. That's the nature no, of an but, independent but, 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 inquiry. But, but, Do you trust the United no, Nations you have to no, hold such a thing? Uh, quite frankly, how does one find objective information in a society where people who speak out against the leadership will face violent uh, retribution? Finally, you describe Gaza as a prison uh, which is surrounded by Hamas. A prison that is of Hamas. No, I would say Hamas is a prison and the jailer is Hamas. Right, OK. But it is, in fact, Israel that contains Gaza, will not let anybody in or will not let anybody out. That is your authority that does that. We control our borders yeah. and we have to control our borders because precisely but you know because better you than Hamas. I. You know better than I that Gaza is a cesspit and quite literally the sewage system has broken down power is all but absent i mean can you imagine the lives of two million people this cannot go on and who is responsible for that you and the palestinians i disagree two entirely. together I disagree. two together I and you need that. to talk together i don't accept that i, do, I of course israelis and palestinians have to to talk and we have to find a way to make peace but for you to say you have a regime in gaza that invests its energy and its time... I know you've told time. us that, Ambassador. In, in fairness, no, but, you have. No, but let's see. I haven't said something that needs to be said. This you is have the a last regime... point. Thank you. We have a regime in Gaza that puts its energy and its resources and its, its program into its so-called holy war against my country instead of worrying about schools and health care and the development and jobs of people in Gaza. That's why the people of Gaza suffer. The people there are the victims of a regime that puts its extremist ideology above and beyond the interests of the people. Ambassador, That's thank, the truth. You, thank you very much indeed for coming in. My pleasure. There's been more international condemnation today of Israel's security forces killing dozens of protesters on its border with Gaza. Boris Johnson has been meeting his European counterparts in Brussels. Kylie Morris is in Washington, where the White House is standing behind Israel, but first to Fatima Manji in Brussels. Fatima. Well, John, at this very minute, Boris Johnson is in a meeting with his Iranian counterpart, Javad Zarif, alongside the German, French and EU foreign ministers. Now, the focus of that meeting is on salvaging the Iran deal after the US pulling out uh, last week. More on that in just a moment. But on the issue of Gaza, it has to be said, condemnation here has been carefully worded. There has been mention of both sides and Hamas. Nevertheless, clear criticism of Israel. Uh, the EU's foreign policy chief, Frederica Mogherini, saying Israel must respect the right to peaceful protest and reiterating the EU will continue to respect international consensus on Jerusalem. So clear water then between the position here in Brussels and what's happening in Washington. But what of the UK? Should the British government be taking a stronger stance? We took the opportunity to put that to Boris Johnson a little earlier. We can do um, OK, but, thank you very much. Foreign Secretary, your response to Israel's actions in Gaza has been called limp. Do you think that's a fair assessment? So, as you saw, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson uh, refusing to engage on the question of Israel and condemnation. Uh, incidentally, that word limp that I put to him is a quote from Tory backbencher Nicholas Soames, who uh, described uh, the Foreign Office's position on Israel, uh, in Israel's actions in Gaza as being limp. Uh, now, back to the issue of the Iran deal and what they're doing in that meeting is trying to put together the pieces after the US uh, has decided to pull out. Mr Johnson is seeking to make progress in that area. He did tell us the key focus will be looking at protecting European and UK businesses who want to do uh, trade deals with Iran, given that they now face the risk of US sanctions. He also added that he will be taking up difficult consular cases with Javad Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, perhaps a reference there to the 39-year-old British Iranian mother, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, who has been imprisoned in Iran for five years uh, after being convicted of spying. Fatima, thanks very much. Well, the UN Security Council has held an emergency meeting following the deadly violence in Gaza, which coincided with America opening its new embassy in Israel in Jerusalem. U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley said it would be a mistake to blame the deaths on the embassy moving from Tel Aviv to the city, which Palestinians view as their capital. Instead, she blamed Hamas and its backers in Iran, while praising Israel for its restraint. Kylie Morris is in Washington, D.C. Kylie. 
Kathy, yes, perhaps unsurprisingly, the U.S. ambassador has really described a position that, together with Israel, sets the U.S. apart from most other countries in their assessment of what's been happening in Gaza. It does feel very much influenced, I have to say, by domestic politics here in the U.S. Certainly, that emphasis on Tehran as a regional aggressor inciting violence in Gaza. Let's hear what Nikki Haley has been saying. In recent days, Hamas terrorists, backed by Iran, have incited attacks against Israeli security forces and infrastructure. Those who suggest that the Gaza violence has anything to do with the location of the American embassy are sorely mistaken. Moving the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem was the right thing to do. There is no plausible peace agreement under which Jerusalem would no longer remain the capital of Israel. The United States is prepared to support peace negotiations and a peace agreement in every way. We want nothing more than peace. Well, the U.S. ambassador to Israel has said that Donald Trump's decision to move the embassy has proved his most popular to date with the U.S. public. Can this be true? Kathy, it is popular, certainly, in some quarters. You know, there is very little light between the Republican Party and Likud on these matters. And for President Trump's supporters, this is their man kind of delivering on a promise that he made. But the images of Gaza contrast so heavily with this view of moving the embassy as a precursor to peace. You know, those extraordinary pictures yesterday of violence on the border at the same time as a very kind of well-mannered ceremony to open the embassy in Jerusalem prompted one New York Times columnist to compare a smiling Ivanka Trump to a Zionist Marie Antoinette. And the New York Daily News headline today was Daddy's Little Ghoul. So it's certainly an overstatement to say that everyone here has fallen into line. Kathy. Kylie, thanks very much. After Gaza's horrific day of bloodshed yesterday, in which over 60 Palestinian protesters were shot dead by Israeli troops, came the funerals of those who lost their lives. And as families gathered to bury the men and children, Israel and the United States insisted that the militant group Hamas, which rules Gaza, was ultimately to blame for provoking the protests. The thousands who were injured continued to be treated in Gaza's hospitals, which doctors said were now at breaking point. They were burying their dead in Gaza today, and there were many to bury. Yasan Tabesi was 22, and yesterday joined with thousands of others to protest against Israel. He, like so many of his fellow protesters, had sought to have his voice heard, but was silenced by the bullet of an Israeli sniper. Many of those who joined him in that protest are still being treated in Gaza's hospitals. They barely have the basics to keep these places running. Now, staff are treating thousands in crowded and makeshift conditions. The humanitarian uh, aspect here is very bad. And we have shortage in staff and in uh, equipment. And, uh, and uh, we are nearing uh, system collapse. We hope not, but uh, we don't know what will happen. Dr. Motasim Al Nono was working in the same hospital as patients were brought in. Amongst them was his older brother. He couldn't save his life. They, they tell, told me that my brother is wounded. I see my family screaming loud. Then I, I understand that my brother was dead. He's very clear what he feels about those who shot his brother. Monsters. They are monsters. Shooting unarmed people, civilians. Today, Israeli weapons were still trained on the land where so many died. But after the carnage, few protesters gathered to mark Nakba, known as the Day of Catastrophe, when Palestinians lost their land to the newly formed Israel. Thousands had been expected to gather here today, but Gaza's Day of Catastrophe came early. As a result of so many dead or injured, official protest has given way to three days of official mourning. Some did still burn tires and throw stones towards Israeli security, but their defiance has been tempered by a feeling of defeat. As well as the lives lost here, there has been a loss of spirit and hope, leaving Palestinians to question what it will take for Gaza's crisis to be properly addressed by the rest of the world. Emma Murphy. News at 10, Gaza. 
It's the tortured and bitterly disputed history of Israel's creation and what happened to Palestine that makes finding an end to this conflict so apparently impossible. With its creation 70 years ago in 1948, the map was redrawn and the state of Israel was born. More than 700,000 Palestinians fled their homes for refugee camps in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip and in neighboring Arab countries. Since then, many Israelis have felt under siege all their lives with numerous wars with Arab neighbors and attacks by various Palestinian groups. While consistently expanding illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank have made Palestinians feel they will never have a viable state of their own, leaving many with no hope for the future. The competing claims on Jerusalem were all too obvious this evening at the Damascus Gate entrance to the old city. The Israeli security forces wanted Palestinian protesters to move along for fear of incitement. Yesterday's U.S. Embassy opening has fueled Palestinian fears that their bond with Jerusalem is being weakened. Ten miles away and Ramallah, the Palestinian capital these days, has been in mourning for the dead of Gaza. But Ramallah closed down to grieve something else as well, for today has been the 70th anniversary of what they call the catastrophe, the loss of Arab land and homes that came with the establishment of Israel. This black day in the Arab calendar saw pent-up Palestinian rage spill out onto the streets here. The clashes followed a familiar pattern as protesters advanced and then retreated in the face of tear gas and rubber bullets. This is mid-afternoon in Ramallah. 17 years ago, I was in exactly the same place watching exactly the same thing happen. But back then, as well as rioting, the Palestinians carried out suicide bomb attacks. Hundreds of Israeli civilians were killed in a relentless campaign over the four years of the Second Intifada. Eventually, to keep out the suicide attackers, the Israelis put up a wall around Palestinian areas. Ever since, it's barriers, not bridges, that have been built here. In the 70 years since the creation of the State of Israel, the Palestinian cause has never been so weak. These people see themselves as abandoned by the Americans, occupied by the Israelis, and badly let down by the Palestinian leadership. In 1948, an estimated 700,000 Palestinians fled or were forced from their homes in what is now Israel. Huda Imam lives two miles from the family home from which her father was sent packing 70 years ago. They have actually uh, uh, robbed uh, uh, not only my father's house, but uh, the whole of Palestine and the uh, the spirit of, uh, of the people who were living uh, there at that time, and perhaps part of my spirit as well. The right of return is just one insoluble issue in an intractable conflict that has brought the Palestinians to the point where they've never been weaker or more isolated. John Irvine, News at 10, on the West Bank. Here, the Prime Minister Theresa May described the loss of life as tragic and concerning, and she said she found the use of live ammunition by Israeli soldiers deeply troubling. Her words, however, were in stark contrast with how our closest ally, the United States, saw the situation in Gaza. America's ambassador to the UN stressed Israel had acted with restraint that many countries would not have shown. Our Washington correspondent Robert Moore joins uh, uh, me now. Um, Robert, it's the second time in barely a week that very, very clear differences in policy uh, over the Middle East have been revealed, haven't they? That's absolutely right. And frankly, given the kind of horrifying images that flowed out of Gaza yesterday, given the uh, extent of the bloodshed, in normal times you would expect uh, the United States to join its European allies and calling uh, for Israel to show uh, uh, some restraint. But actually, not a bit of it. Uh, today, U.S. officials have been pointing the finger solely at a combination of Hamas and Iran. 
And indeed, at the UN Security Council, the US ambassador to the UN went out of her way to praise Israeli conduct by asking and then answering this rhetorical question. I asked my colleagues here in the Security Council, who among us would accept this type of activity on your border? No one would. No country in this chamber would act with more restraint than Israel has. In fact, the records of several countries here today suggest they would be much less restrained. Well, notably, she then walked out of the chamber when the Palestinian representative to the Security Council began to speak. I think it all underlines just what a great rift is developing. It's not just on this issue uh, about Gaza. It's also about, most obviously, last week, America pulling out of the Iran deal. It's also about America uh, potentially imposing tariffs on, on Europe as well. I think what really infuriates European diplomats is how the new, there appears uh, to be no strategy. There's no alternative to the Iran deal that this administration has articulated. No viable uh, resolution or proposal to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict either. So last week on this program, we spoke about this great rift in transatlantic relations. This week, it appears to be widening still further. OK, Robert, in Washington, thanks very much indeed. There was relative calm in Gaza today, with Israelis and Palestinians mostly counting the cost of yesterday's violence. For Israelis, it's the diplomatic and reputational cost. For the Palestinians, the cost has been measured in tens of lives. They were burying the 58 people killed yesterday. Two more lives were lost today. At the UN Security Council, there was an emergency debate. Nikki Haley, the US ambassador, was something of an outlier in arguing that Israel had acted with restraint. She walked out of the session when the Palestinian representative began to speak. Well, if yesterday's violence was a symptom of an underlying, unresolved struggle between two peoples, is any attention being paid to the cause? Does President Trump have a plan for the Palestinians other than to tell them to live with the reality of Israeli occupation? Does anyone? Let's hear from Mark Urban. It's been a day of grief and anger in Gaza. Dozens of people gunned down in yesterday's violence were laid to rest. Little wonder then that feelings across the narrow coastal strip have been so somber. The mood has been um, extremely sad. There have been a lot of funerals today. Um, a lot of people just saying goodbye to their loved ones. Um, in my neighborhood, there have been funerals yesterday, actually, right after or during the protests. Uh, three funerals passed by my house. There were clashes today also, but at a much lower intensity. The mosques had not appealed for demonstrations, and people who did turn out faced tear gas dropped by Israeli drones. If they choose to send people forward to try to dismantle the fence or to attack Israeli troops, then the immediate consequence are that we continue to defend ourselves and then there are casualties on the other side. How to contain this violence? There were calls today, not least in London, for an international inquiry into yesterday's events. There is an urgent need to establish the facts of what happened yesterday through an independent and transparent investigation, including why such a volume of live fire was used and what role Hamas played in events. Was connected with but when Gaza was debated in the UN Security Council this afternoon, the American ambassador defended Israel to the hilt. I asked my colleagues here in the Security Council, who among us would accept this type of activity on your border? No one would. No country in this chamber would act with more restraint than Israel. And then she walked out when the Palestinian ambassador was speaking. Well, I have to say that uh, uh, Trump uh, has sent his uh, envoy. His uh, son-in-law came about 18 times with his um, envoy, uh, Greenblatt, uh, to see the Palestinian leadership. There were constructive discussions. They were emphasizing that Trump will not stand idle. He will come forward with a plan. Instead, they have received a shocking move to uh, relocate the American embassy. They have seen a total denial and more and more speeches at the UN where the Palestinians' rights were totally ignored. 
Yesterday's embassy opening provoked a deep chill with the Palestinians. They've tonight recalled their representative in the US in protest. President Trump, though, has implied there could be a quid pro quo for the embassy move. Siding with Israel, especially on these two very crucial issues, the JCPOA, the Iran deal most of all, um, also can give cachet to the American administration. After all, if you think of the peace process, it's Israel that's being asked to make concessions in a sense or to give back territory and take some risks. And usually the American position has been, therefore we have to stand by Israel and make sure the Israelis are willing to take that risk. The Trump administration can credibly say that more than anyone recently at least, they are able to uh, convey to the Israelis that they have their back if they were to ask something of the Israelis. The blockade, the deaths and the war of words are all facets of the current diplomatic stalemate. And after so many false dawns, it would take visionary leadership to revive hope in negotiations right now. Mark Urban there. Well, earlier I spoke to Michael Oren, the uh, Deputy Minister for Diplomacy in the Israeli government and the former Israeli ambassador to the US. I asked him about the Palestinians who believe East Jerusalem should be the capital of their state. Can he understand why they are angry if that's not on offer? Israel annexed East Jerusalem in July 1967, uh, 51 years ago. Yeah. Um, this is not new. That has been our policy since then. There's one Jerusalem. We don't even consider East Jerusalem East Jerusalem. There's only one Jerusalem. Yes, the world has not accorded with it. Right now, we have the United States being the first country to move its embassy there. And we're very, very grateful for it. And other countries will follow. What can I say? If, if the Jewish people and the Jewish state did everything according to the international community, I wouldn't be sitting here and you wouldn't be interviewing me. Well, look, the question is, is it on offer? Are you willing to make the serious compromises that the Palestinians feel need to be made to get them back into the negotiations? Now, I know you'll say, well, they've got to make compromises too. But at the moment, they are the weak ones. They don't have the weapons. They don't have one contiguous piece of land. I just wonder whether you are willing to be the kind of the big guys in the room and say, let's sort this out and make some grand gestures. Now, is Israel willing to do that? And by the way, also address issues of settlements in the, the West Bank? It seems to me if the Palestinians really wanted a state, if they really wanted to live side by side with us in peace, they'd come to the table without making concessions. We understand that once they get to the, the table, everybody's got to make concessions. That's the nature of negotiations. Right. It won't be easy for us. I'm speaking now as a member of Israel's government, the member of the parliament. Trust me, it won't be easy for us. Right. I think but it won't they, be easy for them, too. No they, one's going to get anywhere they unless they worry. come to the table. They worry that Israel is just getting a little bit too comfortable with the status quo. Palestinians trapped behind walls, locked behind fences, kept away, and Israel just carrying on, occupying a lot of land, a lot of land that does not belong to Israel. And they're just thinking, this is getting stuck here. What would you do, Dr. Oren? What would you do if you were an angry Palestinian who wanted to change the status quo and sees Israel all too comfortable with it? That's a, that's a legitimate question. If I were that Palestinian, I'd come to the negotiating table. And I'd say, I take up President Trump's offer. President Trump offered publicly twice to exact a, 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 a concession for Israel in return for opening that embassy. But the Palestinians are not missing an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Israel's got to be the only country in the world which, on repeated times, has offered to redivide its eternal capital. Uh, offered to, 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 to divide it with the Palestinians. And the Palestinians not only rejected it, they rejected it with violence. When we offered them that deal in 2000 and again in 2001, we had 1,000 Israelis killed by terrorist bombings, uh, many of them in Jerusalem. So, you know, it, 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 I understand you feel the pre you, you want to feel their pain. How about feeling our pain here? Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I know we appear to be the, the big Goliath there. We're, we're a tiny country that is surrounded by... Uh, many hundreds of thousands of people, many of them who want to destroy us. I'm sorry, I'm, and, uh, you're asking and, and me, Dr. Oren, you're it. asking me to feel your pain when 60 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli guns yesterday and one Israeli troop was slightly injured in that day of exchanges. And you're saying, feel our pain, don't feel the pain of the Palestinians. Come on, I'm trying to get from you that you are big enough to say, guys, we're going to make concessions because we're the power here and you are weak. But it sounds to me, from everything you're saying, that you're not up for that. But that's, but and that's, then you but can that's see not why the Palestinians I, I actually across. say, 
Israel has repeatedly come to the table, repeatedly offered to make concessions, has put maps on the table. They've all been rejected by the Palestinians. You know, they're not taking us up on this, and I don't know why you're not hearing them, because they keep on saying it over and over again. It's like, it's like what's happening in Gaza. Uh, Hamas burns the food, burns the fuel, creates a humanitarian crisis, sends people up to the fence to get to get shot because they're going to break through the fence because we have to defend our fence. And what does your television station do? You're basically an accessory to the terror. You say to Hamas, hey, this is working great. This is a great tactic. Keep doing it. Send some more kids up to the fence. Right. We, we actually don't say that. You're an and accessory I, 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 to I terror. Would, I would stress that I, a lot of people worry yeah. about the broken government uh, or the broken state that exists in Gaza. And, 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 you know, there will be multiple reasons for that. But fixing Palestinian society is a... Is a, is a task for everybody. Look, let me just ask you one last one. Nikki Haley got up at the United Nations Security Council and left just as the Palestinian uh, representative started speaking. Is that a way, do you think, for Israel and the United States to show that they are listening and feeling the pain of the Palestinians in a way that is going to advance a settlement of this awful crisis? I am not a spokesman for Nikki Haley, nor for the American administration. Uh, all I know is I sit around and listen to a lot of abuse by Palestinians and others. But I do have this one question. Do you know what's happening in Syria today? The Syrian army is attacking the Yarmouk Palestinian refugee camp outside of Damascus. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of Palestinians being killed. Do you care when Arabs... Do you I exactly, care when I really Arabs kill Arabs? Not to only ask, when I Jews prefer, have to kill Arabs Dr. because they're forced to defend I prefer themselves. To, I prefer to ask of them course you to answer them. Of course it's, it's, you it's don't. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Good of night. course you don't. Of course you don't. Thank you. Bye. Well, I'm uh, joined from Jerusalem by Ziad Khalil Abu Zayed, who is the international media spokesperson for Fatah. That's the Palestinian party which dominates the West Bank and is headed by Palestine, Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas. A very good evening to you. I wonder whether, Ziad, you have any sympathy for the Israeli position that they do actually feel, and they can quote words that Palestinians say, that they feel that the Palestinians do not mean them well uh, and it makes difficult for them to, to negotiate and, and, and deal with attacks on the border. It's actually like asking from the victim to sympathize with the occupation force, which just killed 60 Palestinians, civilian Palestinians, including three children and one lady and a child, a baby child that is mo only a few months old. Then today to come to the news and uh, see such a statement that came by the Interior Security Minister Ardan, who is the Israeli one, who said when he was asked what is the reason for killing so many civilians on the Israeli media, he answered saying that there is no difference between those killed on the Palestinian side and the Nazis that would be killed in any war, such as the Second War. Such a sympathy can't be found when we hear such statements and the complete deny of the Palestinian right to go, go out and uh, have their freedom of expression to go out and say that enough is enough. Gaza is not a state. Gaza is a city that is under siege from all of the directions around it. And Israel is responsible for the situation that has been going on there. The, the pe people who went out into these demonstrations are sick of the situation that they have been living for a long, long time now and, and wanted to say to the world that we have, we have the right to call for equality and our basic rights. Well, well, let me put this to you. If you could persuade the Israelis that you meant well to a certain degree the whole thing might be unlocked but at the moment maybe the palestinians are giving the israelis the pretext to use violent force to keep the palestinians behind those fences now let me ask you this do you for example accept the existence of israel unambiguously and clearly in its say 1967 borders or something close to them if you go back to 2006, since President yeah. Mahmoud Abbas uh, took the lead of the country, he applied the roadmap and the quarterly uh, 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 committee that demanded from him a lot of uh, sacrifices for the sake of uh, reaching somewhere in the negotiations process that was unfortunately used by the Israeli government one after the other to administrate the conflict. If you go back to the Arab Peace Initiative that was signed by more than 50 Arab and Muslim countries who said that they're ready to, re to go into an right. immediate peace uh, treaty with Israel in exchange for an Israeli recognition of the uh, Palestinian existence on their occupied 67 lands. And the only answer okay. that we got since the days of Ariel Sharon until today is simply a negative right. answer. So I'll take that as a yes. 
yes, you do recognize the right of Israel to exist. Can you help me out? Why is there not a current peace process? They say you guys must come to the negotiating table. I'm trying to understand why there is no, why there is no process. What is your explanation for that? The explanation is that we've, we negotiated the peace process for more than 25 years and the only thing we got back from the Israelis is a continuous process of administrating the conflict until we reach the situation where today's uh, Bibi uh, government says that it does not even recognize the Palestinians' right to live in a state of their own. The question today is for the Israeli government that sooner or later, and it's a matter only of a few years, they will be f facing a new reality in which they're surrounded by millions of Palestinians, that they will be calling for equality and basic human rights. Will they be able to say no also for equality? I don't think so. It will be a conflict similar to South Africa that would lead all of us into a more difficult conflict in the region because of the stubbornness and uh, unbelievable uh, belief that the Israeli right. government holds which completely den denies the Palestinian right in their yeah. lands and uh, uh, their basic human rights. Yeah, thanks, thanks for talking to us and I hope you did hear we did put some of those kinds of questions to the Israeli minister as well. Thanks.